Okay, let's pray. Father, we are here to celebrate and thank you for the young men and women who comprise the Westminster Schools of Augusta class of 2019, for their families who have sent them here, those who are most committed to their long-term welfare, for their teachers and administrators who wisely spend their lives sculpting youth, that message we send to a generation we will not see. We pray your blessing on all Westminster personnel and for their service to these students and their families. Thank you for sustaining this school for nearly 50 years, and please continue to prosper its future. We thank you for the privilege of a Christian education rooted in the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of all knowledge, where all wisdom begins. Enriched with a perspective that this earthly life is but a vapor, that a life of selfish ambition is a dead-end road, and that what naturally excites us most will in time be forgotten. Father, you gave us the example of the Lord Jesus who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And we pray our students will live lives in this manner. As they choose their schools and courses, may they search out churches and campus ministries and plug into them even before school begins. And Father, as they have their own sinful nature to deal with, when they stray, may their pain be acute, the damage superficial, and the lessons permanent. May they quickly come to own in their hearts what they know in their heads to be true. Use these students to advance your kingdom and your will on earth and to honor your name. Above all the truths they have learned, keep fervent in their hearts the glories of your eternal kingdom. We look forward to that time when the knowledge of thee covers the waters, covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. Now we commit this service to you and most importantly, these young men and women. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing for the hymn. <clears throat>
Good evening. I would like to welcome all of our families and friends of our graduates, some whom, whom have traveled as far as China to be, with her, be here with us tonight uh, for these significant events this weekend in the lives of our seniors and in Westminster Schools of Augusta. I would certainly like to thank several people for their leadership with Westminster's graduation ceremonies this weekend. Mary Hudson for organizing our music tonight and tomorrow, and Tommy Brinson for sharing his instrumental talents. Special thank you goes to Catherine Smith and Crystal Duggan and Alex McCauley for their dedicated work in planning this monumental occasion in the life of our seniors and our school. We could not do what we do so well without our amazing faculty who have worked long hours modeling our core values, challenging our students in every educational arena while pushing each student to become a portrait of a Westminster graduate. Please take time this weekend at our receptions to give them uh, your gratitude and thankful heart for what they've done for our students this year. They do amazing work every day and they're so committed to our mission. A special thanks goes to Ashley Roach, Westminster's board chair and the full board of trustees who have labored this year uh, with our mission and worked hard uh, to keep us moving in the right direction. Thank you for uh, First Presbyterian Church. Our pastors here at the church have partnered with us well this year and have been uh, along our side as we have gone through a great school year and I'm very grateful for our partnership with First Presbyterian Church. To the class of 2019, it is time for you to transition again. Your last transition, I was kicking you out of the middle school up to the high school, and you did that really well. Now a much bigger transition from high school to college, from living at home where you know where the food is to having a roommate that may not like the same food that you do, from having a comfortable parking space at 3067 Wheeler Road to may not even having a car and having to walk to school, your class is uphill both ways. <laughs> from worshiping in your home church to trying to find a place to worship. It's not only a transition for you, it's a transition for your family. It's a transition for your parents, your grandparents, your siblings. And so remember that as you go off. Remember where you came from. The good news is that you're prepared. You're prepared academically, mentally, socially, physically, and spiritually. And we are very proud of all of your work. Duffy Doherty, a colorful Michigan State football coach in years past, used to say that you needed only three bones to journey well through life. A wishbone to dream on, a backbone for the strength and courage to get through the tough times, and a funny bone to laugh at life along the way. Not bad advice, and I think this advice applies well to the class of 2019. This outstanding senior class dreamed big and got nine out of nine into the University of Georgia early action last fall, received $3 million worth of college and state funded scholarships, won seven athletic state championships, two one act state championships, finished in the top three of state literary all five years, all four years in a row, and had the first ever senior to win all state course six years in a row, Luke Yared. Class of 2019, go to your university and never stop dreaming. We need dreamers, we need problem solvers, and wish takers to help us continue to spread the good news. Class of 2019, you showed a strong backbone to finish well at Westminster. Others left over the years, but you stayed the course. Through the tough times, you fought through adversity and made sacrifices to get tomorrow a Westminster diploma. 20 students began in PK and went all the way through Westminster. 
The tough times are not over in school. The tough times are not over in life. But always remember the backbone that you developed at Westminster. Class of 2019, you have developed a well funny bone. Please don't lose your smile, Cassie. Please don't lose your smile, Caroline. Don't forget your sometimes outrageous laughter, Jana. And never ever hide or deny your fun-loving spirit. The class of 2019 would not have been as exciting without the lively spirit of Anders and Lee and James, the life of the party. Even though it freaked me out for a day or so, putting the school up for sale on the first day of class is kind of funny now. <laughs> but more importantly, it led me to my hit single, I Will Always Love You, class of 2019. When you leave Westminster, make sure you take your funny bone, laugh and smile and keep a big sense of humor about the good old days. I am blessed to have been your middle school principal. I got to teach a few of you American history and now serve as your head of school. My prayer is that when you arrive at college next fall, you will resemble this is the third time, a turtle on a fence post. A turtle on a fence post is distinctively different, rare, and causes people to say, hmm, what's different about that person? Be different in college. The turtle on the fence post did not get to the top of the post without help. So remember to enlist the support of others to lift you up to the top of the post. You can't do it alone, and you have a big, big God who can help you. You have family and friends here in Augusta, and you certainly want to see you come back and visit us, teachers in your school. Finally, when you're at the top of the post, take a look around, see the larger perspective of life, knowing that it's not about you. but it's about God who has called you to a special purpose and a special plan. Tonight is a worship service, and I want to thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who has initiated relationship with us, identified with us, and inspired us to glory our Heavenly Father in all that we do and all that we say. It's a celebration and worship of God's goodness and thanksgiving for the lives dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom. And we will soon receive our baccalaureate address by the Reverend Andy Lee, Associate Pastor at First Presbyterian Church of Augusta. Mr. Lee has many responsibilities at First Presbyterian Church, including leadership training, member care, and foreign missions. Over the years, Mr. Lee has moved between work in the business world and work as a full-time minister. He's done it all from overseeing the testing and manufacturing of specialized processors used for some of the Star Wars computer-generated imagery, to working as a consultant to the World Bank, to living in China, Bahrain, Singapore, and Indonesia with his family. In his work as a minister, Mr. Lee was sent by the Presbyterian Church in America to start the PCA's first church in Honolulu, Hawaii. Andy and his wife, Ali, have six children. Their youngest, Avelina, is graduating with this year's Westminster senior class. In his spare time, Mr. Lee enjoys improving as a small engine repairman. Westminster thanks you for your ministry to and support of Westminster and this year's senior class. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for being with us tonight. It is also tradition at a baccalaureate to hear senior student testimonies reflecting on their time and spiritual growth here at Westminster. In a few moments, Ms. Caroline Campbell and Mr. Thomas Drake will be sharing their reflections on the following. What has God taught you at Westminster? Or how has God been at work in your life? How is he shaping you and forming you into the person that you are today? I pray that the Holy Spirit will open your heart for these powerful testimonies of how God is at work behind the scenes at Westminster through relationships 
student to teacher, teacher to coach, uh, student to coach, and student to, uh, student to student. I'm reminded of how our God is a relational God, and it is through relationships that the Lord is preparing Westminster students to be warriors for Christ as they go off to their respective colleges and universities. Our first student speaker was made, Westminster has made Westminster home for 13 years. Over that time, she has served on the student leadership team, has led a high school girls small group, served as a member of the sporting clays and shooting, uh, the sporting clays shooting and cross country teams and participated in the National Honor Society and the Beta Club. Caroline is the older sister to three brothers at Westminster, William, Henry, and Charlie, and is the daughter of Dr. Robert and Renee Campbell. Caroline will attend the University of Georgia Honors College in the fall. Some of her favorite things include listening to music by Bob Dylan and sipping on a nice cup of hot tea. In her spare time, Caroline enjoys CrossFit, hiking, and playing guitar. Caroline Campbell is an exemplary student wonderful young woman and a child of God, and we are so excited to see what she will accomplish as she embarks on this new journey. Caroline, thanks for your servant heart, your big smile, and your positive, encouraging words that are said at the right time. Our second student speaker this evening after the faculty ensemble performance is Thomas Drake. Thomas has been a part of the Westminster family for more than 14 years. He is the son of Jeff and Jennifer Drake, an older brother to Samuel, Molly, Cynthia, and David. His passionate dedication to bettering himself and the school over these many years is truly inspiring. Thomas was the first, was the service leader on the student leadership team this year and is a member of the National Honor Society and National Beta Club. Thomas is a four-time state champion and captained the boys' soccer team for the last two years. He will attend Covenant College in the fall to play soccer at the next level and plans to major in pre-medical studies. Thomas is an outstanding student, athlete, friend, and a true gentleman. We are excited to see God's plan unfold in his life as he launches from Westminster. Thomas, thanks for your hard work. Thanks for your leadership on and off the field. And thank you for the wonderful example of committing to excellence in all things. It's time now for Caroline. Caroline. I have been a Westminster student for 13 years, and last month, a few seniors and I were asked to speak at a lower school chapel about our early years. As I began to recall those early memories, like who kissed who in the ark at recess, the Raptor Center field trip to Statesboro, and field day races, I also began to recall events that have greatly shaped my faith and my character. I want to share some of those early memories, as well as a few memories from the past four years that have been significant in my spiritual formation during my time at Westminster. My earliest, my earliest memories of Westminster are from Miss Ames's TK class. In order to help us memorize Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, we learn the verses as a song. The verses say, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. When I was younger, this song was comforting and I would sing it to myself whenever I was scared. However, as I've gotten older, these verses have become more than a comfort. They have become, they have affected the way I think and how I make decisions. We know, of course, that our knowledge and understanding has increased at Westminster, but what Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 teaches me is that my understanding is limited, but that God's ways are always good and that God's ways are always trustworthy. It wasn't long till I had moved down the hall to Miss Mocha's first grade class. It was time for our regular Friday spelling test, and I thought I was going to fail. I think the word mosquito was involved, and honestly, I still have to look that one up. In my seven-year-old mind, I thought that secretly writing the words on my arm was a great idea and a surefire way to get 100. Fortunately, my parents caught me in the act, and I was forced to take an agonizing march to Miss Mocha's classroom with my dad before school started to apologize. I don't remember the specific consequences, but I do remember her wrapping her arms around me and praying with me. 
She told me that honesty and integrity are more important than any grade I would ever make. Ms. Mocha modeled Christ by her forgiveness, and that is something I'll never forget. The third memory I have is from Lower School Chapel. Two guest musicians would come once or twice per year and lead our Lower School Chapel in worship. One of my favorite songs that they sang was the Fruits of the Spirit song. In elementary school, I liked this song because you would say the fruits in the spirit over and over, starting off slowly, then saying them faster and faster until unintelligible noises started coming out of our mouths. This past April during master's break, I was working at a hospitality house in Augusta. I was overwhelmed and distraught by the drunkenness, inappropriate comments, and in general awful behavior by adults that week. The environment was disorienting. I asked the Lord to give me wisdom about how to act in the situation, and I was reminded of the Fruits of the Spirit song. As I worked that week, I prayed through love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God used this to remind me of what is truly beautiful and what I want to embody and reflect. I know that there will be similar situations in college, and I am trusting that the Spirit will continue to bear His fruit in me. And then came middle school. I'm sure that I learned something spiritual in middle school, but honestly, I'm just glad that I made it through. <laughs> I actually did love middle school, but I wanted to share some high school memories. In my 10th grade year of high school, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. That year, the normal concerns of a high school girl, such as outfits, boyfriends, and even homework, were overshadowed by the worry I had for my mom. I was challenged not only to maintain good grades and take on extra responsibilities around the house, but also forced to grow up quickly. Though I wrestled a lot with fear that year and uncertainty, Westminster provided a safe place for me and my brothers. One particularly hard day, I found myself in the upper school office pouring out my heart and my tears to Ms. Boone. I know that the Lord had her there that day to give me the encouragement that I needed. I've always known that our faculty cares for our personal and spiritual development, possibly more than our academic development, but I really experienced their love and care during this time. I experienced firsthand how my school community, friends, and church loved us well, with meals, rides to activities for my little brothers, and other thoughtful things. These acts of love towards our family overwhelmed us with gratefulness. I can honestly say that though I would never have chosen this experience, I learned about perseverance, community, faith, and overcoming fears. Most importantly, I learned to have hope even when the way is unclear, and thankfulness even when there is suffering. The fifth and final memory that stands out to me is from Mr. Hood's apologetics class during my senior year, I mean my junior year. Because I have grown up in the church and in a Christian school, I think it was easy for me not to think through my faith deeply. I have heard about Jesus all day, every day, which, don't get me wrong, is such a blessing. But a personal faith was so easy to take for granted. However, during my junior year, I had lots of questions about God and wrestled a lot with doubt. In apologetics, we read the books. Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, and Letters from a Skeptic by Gregory Boyd. These books were life-changing for me as they broke down Christianity to its basic beliefs and answered my many questions. With Mr. Hood's commentary and the ability to freely ask questions in his class, I felt like I was really beginning to understand what being a Christian meant. I still refer to these books as resources for my questions. I know that Westminster has given me a biblical perspective that has shaped me and a solid foundation that will support me as I engage in the culture around me. In closing, I want to thank my teachers who have pointed me to the source of all knowledge. Many of you have become more than a teacher to me. You have become a role model and a mentor. Thank you for challenging me and my classmates to be all God has created us to be. Over two-thirds of my 18 years have been spent on the Westminster campus with great friends and incredible teachers, and for that I am very grateful. It hasn't always been easy socially, academically, or spiritually, but looking back, I wouldn't change a thing. Academically, I feel well prepared for my next step, four years studying classics, Mandarin, and sciences at University of Georgia. Spiritually, I feel a bit like the Apostle Paul who says in the message, message version of Philippians 3, 12 through 14, I'm not saying that I have all this together, that I have made it, but I'm on my way reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me, don't get me wrong, by no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward, to Jesus. I'm off and running and I'm not looking back. Thank you.
Welcome parents, grandparents, family, and friends. Thank you all for coming to this year's baccalaureate service. As I look back on the 14 and a half years that I've been at Westminster, I'm reminded of countless experiences I've had that have led me to where I am today. One of my earliest memories and fondest memories is singing the peanut butter song in Mrs. Ames' TK class and falling on the floor laughing at the word underwear. Another is burning my mouth on hot chocolate in Mrs. Moach's class. And to this day, I still don't drink hot drinks. I also recall intense multiplication flashcard competitions in Mr. Griner's class and intense football games at recess. We also used to watch this really old TV show called The Twilight Zone as we worked on our review pages in Mr. Joyner's class. And my personal favorite, goofing off in the most bizarre ways possible with the soccer team. These are memories that I will always remember, but these are not the ones that have impacted me the most. The most impactful memories and experiences are the lessons that God has taught me through this school and through the people at this school that point me to Christ in their daily lives. Some of these people are former students, like Aaron Harris. I remember sitting on the gym floor as an elementary schooler in opening convocation. Now Aaron was a soccer player, so to little fourth grade Thomas, he was the coolest kid at Westminster. And I was able to listen to him talk about how we as Christians should break the mold, which was our theme for the year. We should break the mold of the world as we live for God. And the fact that I still remember that is a testament to how cool I thought he was. But it also shows the incredible experiences that Westminster offers. I was able to hear this gospel shared from a fellow student and someone that I looked up to more than any faculty member, at the time, of course. So. Um, <laughs> It was, a little, it was little moments like these throughout my years at Westminster that the Lord used to shape my life and my walk with Him. I also experienced these in the classroom. One of the most tangible ways is through the actions and attitudes of my teachers. I've had Mr. Rich for three years now, and in my time in his classroom, his dedication to his work has become clearer every day. He loves math, even to the point where he has been known to call it fun. And the way he prepares our lessons, tests, quizzes, and homework clearly points to his enthusiasm, not only for the subject he teaches, but also his enthusiasm to help us learn and understand the material well. He and all of my teachers have truly lived out 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I see this enthusiasm in all my teachers, and I'm truly grateful for each and every one of you, so thank you. Lastly, my time on the soccer team has also provided me with little moments of wisdom that I have taken with me in my life. One example would be that the focus has never been on winning, but on growing as a team on and off the pitch and growing together in the Lord. Coach Fries wrote a devotional about soccer centered on the parable of talents found in Matthew 25, 14 to 30. If you aren't familiar with the story, a man who's going on a journey entrusts his talents, which was a unit of money, to three men. Two of the men went out and invested the money and gave the man double of what he originally gave them when he returned. The other man buried it and returned only what the man gave to him. Jesus' point here was to show people that God has given them many talents, but he didn't give them these talents just to hold on to until they die, but rather to use these talents to further God's kingdom and bring him glory. Coach Reese tied this to soccer by asking whether we would like to play in the game and get dirty and beat up or sit on the bench and stay clean. Whether we would like to use our talents in soccer by playing in the game, or to have talents but never get to use them. He challenged us not only to finish the game with sweat and dirt all over the place, but to use this as a metaphor for life as Jesus intended, and to show, show up at the pearly gates, beat up, tattered, and torn, so that you can tell God that you put to use the talents that he gave you. I would never be able to get this type of Christian encouragement except for an environment like Westminster's. Now with this in mind, I would like to challenge the class of 2019 in three ways. First, I challenge you to break the mold in college. Go into this next stage in life for the Lord and live for the Lord, not for this world. People will notice, and that's a good thing. Second, I challenge you to work at everything, school, athletics, relationships, Work at all of these in college with excellence, not working for man, but for Jesus Christ, just as our amazing faculty has modeled for us. Third, I believe that God has given this class incredible talents. I challenge you to use these talents well in college and in life. Don't hide them away, but work with them, get better at them, and use them to glorify God. 
Finally, I will say this. As I look across at you all, I don't see a single face that I have not either laughed with or talked to on a near weekly basis. Not many people can say they know everyone in their high school by name, much less that they got to really know them. And for that, I am extremely grateful. Thank you. Please join me for prayer, followed by the saying of the Lord's Prayer, which is printed in the program. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for safely bringing all of us here today. We thank you for all the hard work, long nights, and endless hours of studying that have paid off. Thank you for everyone that has helped shape us into the college-bound students we are today. We ask that you help all of us students to stay strong as we go off to college. Keep us aware that you are our cornerstone, comforter, helper, and that you are always there for us and love us. We ask that you guide us to make wise decisions in all we do. All of this we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 8, 3 through 9. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Well, good evening and welcome on behalf of the church to faculty, administration, family, friends, and a warm greeting and congratulations to the class of 2019. It's an honor to be here and to be with you. And our, you know, our baccalaureate service, they say, extends back to the tradition of Oxford University. Back in the 1400s, before the graduates would uh, receive their formal designation as a graduate, they would uh, put on uh, laurel berries uh, on their heads, and they would attend a service. The service lasted, they had speakers, some of the speakers spoke for up to four hours. And all the speeches were in Latin. Let me assure you, I will not speak in Latin, and I will shoot for something less than three hours. Seniors, you're standing at the doorstep of what may well be the richest chapter of your lives. You've reached a milestone that reflects hard work, love, and support of many people. And most of all, you've studied, you've drilled, and you've worked hard to get the right answers. But in many ways, your school, life at school has been producing the right answers. But what I'd like to have you think about tonight in our brief time together is that actually the Bible calls us to think about some profound questions. Not just giving us answers, but causing us and calling us to think. Questions that shape our hearts, our minds, our wills, and the way that we live as Christians. So in our brief time together, I'd like to focus on three questions contained in the Bible. And taken together, they summarize what it means to live as a follower of Jesus Christ. The first question I'd like to bring to our attention is the question found in Genesis 3. After Adam and Eve sinned, they were in the garden, and God came to look for them. They were hiding. The first word after sin enters into the world that God speaks to all of humanity is what? Where are you? 
Now, if we just think about that in a very casual way, that sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? The all-knowing God has just created a beautiful place. He's put Adam and Eve there, and he comes down, and he says, where are they? Actually, it's more a call to wake up. Remember, Adam and Eve were hiding, and they were so steeped in their sin and so cut off from a relationship with God that God had to say, where are you? Some of you have been in a situation where somebody has had to say to you, what were you thinking? Causing you to come to a realization and put into perspective that perhaps what you've done has not been the wisest choice, a healthy choice, or a God-honoring choice. And so the first statement that God gives to humanity after sin comes into the world is, where are you? And as you go forward from here, the ultimate question for you each day and the ultimate question of your life is not where you went to school, not what degree you got, not what job you did, not what you contributed to society, but where are you in relationship to your creator God? Where are you? You see, if you ask yourself that question or hear that question, where are you? It will save you from the compromise and all the tugs of the world. Because at the center of your life is your relationship with God. The world may say, well, it, go ahead and cut corners. Nobody will care. Say, but it hurts my relationship with God. Go ahead and tell the half-truth. Manipulate people and their impressions. But you can ask yourself, where does that put me in relationship with God? Knowing you live for God will give you the courage and joy in this life that nothing else can give. No job, no degree, nothing, except to know that you live a life to please God. So we have in this question, where are you? God's mercy to waken us up from our sin. Where are you? Is a reminder that God is all of life and all of life is lived in relationship with him. The second question that I'd like you to consider has been read for us and it is taken from Psalm 8. The writer of the psalm has looked at all of creation. He's looked at the stars, and he's looked at the grandness of the cosmos. And he just is stunned. For example, when, if you look at the Big Dipper, the light that you are seeing started traveling to Earth in 1919. It's taken 100 years for the light that you see to come to your eye. It's been traveling for much of the much of the history and events that you've read about have not even come to pass. That's how grand the universe is. And it points to an even greater creator. The very fact that we find Earth to be the most hospitable place to our form of life, we don't have to wear a spacesuit, we don't have to have auxiliary devices in order to flourish here, is a testament to the gracious kindness and care of God. So the psalmist looks at creation and he's struck with awe and wonder and he asks the question, what is mankind that you're mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You see, he's made small by looking at the creation and its grand scale. But he also comes to the representation, uh, realization that God still cares for him. You see, humanity in its smallness, in its rebellion against God, humanity's ungratefulness for all that God has done is unmatched by God's care for you and for me. And yet God is actively involved in this care and sustaining your life. This is a, not a God who's too busy, not absent, but the psalmist doesn't just stop at wonder doesn't just stop at asking a question, but he moves on to worship. 
You see, in this question, what are, what are human beings that you would be mindful of them? We have in this question God's great love and care for you. Where are you? What are human beings that you should care for them? And the third question I'd like you to take away and to remember and think about is one that you and I will never have to ask. We'll never have to ask this question. It's spoken by Jesus as God the Father turned his back on him while he hung at the cross. And Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a question that all believers in Jesus will never, ever have to voice because Jesus willingly gave himself as a substitute for sinners. Now in your life, you may well encounter disappointments, setbacks, heartbreak, and maybe even feel that your whole world is collapsing in on you and around you. You may even begin to think that God has abandoned you. But don't think that just because you can't see God that he's not there. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Because when Jesus Christ says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That opens the way to that wonderful promise. I will never leave you or forsake you. What we have in this question, voiced by Jesus on the cross, is the assurance that God will never forsake or abandon you because of what Jesus has done. He was forsaken in your place. So as you go from here, go through the festivities and go on to the next chapter in your life, take with you three questions. Where are you? You live your life in a relationship to a holy God. Secondly, what are human beings that you care for them? You live your life cared for by a great God. And my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You live your life in the confidence of Christ's finished work on the cross. Congratulations as you go forward. May you live a life that is filled with the joy of Christ and his spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join us in praise as we sing Lift High the Cross.
Will you bow with me as I pronounce the benediction? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. And please join us for the reception to my left here.